By the early 1850s, there were around 2,500 people living in Atlanta, 500 of whom were slaves or freed blacks, and most of the others were just folks trying to make a living. There were, however, enough people who felt invested in the city's growth to make the town's yearly elections interesting. With the granting of Atlanta's charter in 1847, tensions grew between the city's two political factions, the Moral Party and the Free and Rowdy Party. The Rowdies had been victorious in each of Atlanta's first three elections. In 1851, Jonathan Norcross made his second bid for mayor as a candidate for the Morals. The Rowdies, using a time-honored political tradition of nominating someone better than themselves, put forth lawyer and former city councilman Leonard Simpson as their candidate. The Morals campaigned for Norcross by holding rallies and passing out candy and fruit to potential voters. The Rowdies, true to their reputation, canvassed the town's 40 bars, picking up the tab for potential voters. In the end, Norcross won the election, but that was not the end of the Rowdies' activities, far from it. Over the next few days, Norcross received numerous threats, with more than one Rowdy boasting that Uncle John would find the town too hot to hold if he tried to institute his proposed reforms. In those days, Atlanta's mayor also served as superintendent of Atlanta's roads and presided over Atlanta's police court. And it was in the courtroom that tensions between the two political factions reached a boiling point. A supporter of the Rowdies was brought before the court and charged with public fighting. It turned out to be a test case in the eyes of the Rowdies, many of whom were in the courtroom to witness the new mayor in action. Mayor Norcross, true to his moral beliefs, found the man guilty as charged and levied a fine, at which time the defendant produced a bowie knife. Chaos ensued with spectators scrambling for the exit and the mayor preparing to defend himself with his chair. Fortunately, someone with a cane struck the hand of the attacking rowdy, knocking the knife to the floor, and in the ensuing confusion, the would-be attacker disappeared into the crowd and reportedly was never seen again. But the pot had now boiled over, and the next day the town was abuzz about the event, with the rowdies threatening action, which they took that evening. A group of rowdies, probably emboldened by drink, went to Decatur, confiscated a cannon on display in front of the courthouse, and brought it to Atlanta. They placed the cannon outside Jonathan Norcross's dry goods store, filled it with sand, and fired it at the building. They then left the cannon in the street, aimed at Norcross's store, and tacked a note to his door, advising the mayor to leave town or the next time they would fire more than sand. The following morning, Norcross took counsel with community members and found several citizens willing to enforce peace and return good order to the community provided it was under the cover of law. They formed a militia, deputized the men, and fanned out through Murals Row, the den of iniquity frequented by the Rowdies. The leaders of the Rowdies were arrested and the next day tried and found guilty. All were fined to the limit of the law, but it did not end there. Norcross continued to receive threats through the mail, such that the militia felt obligated to stand guard over his store lest the cannon be put to use once again. And then, on one of the most fateful nights in Atlanta's history, the militia, having had enough of the rowdies' threats, descended upon the areas of Atlanta known as Slabtown and Snake Nation, this time under the cover of hoods. They proceeded to whip the men out of the bars and their houses, sending them scattering into the adjacent woods. The women were loaded onto wagons and relocated to Decatur, while other of the Whitecaps destroyed the shanty homes of Slabtown and burned Snake Nation to the ground. By all accounts, that was the end of the clash between the Morals and the Rowdies. Peace and the rule of law were returned to the community, the Rowdies ceased their political activity, though Murals Row, now just Decatur Street, remained the epicenter of debauchery that it always had been. Over time, the inhabitants of Slabtown rebuilt their homes and Snake Nation remained vacant for several years, until a man named Daniel Castleberry came to Atlanta and opened a store in that location, a location that would ultimately be renamed Castleberry Hill. This is Lance Russell, and that is one of the stories of Atlanta.